Hello, everyone, and this is the Miami Vice podcast, episode three of the Miami Vice podcast, the quintessential show about the quintessential 80s TV show from a group of people who are starting completely fresh and have never seen an episode of Miami Vice before. My name is Dominic, joining you here from Phoenix, and as always, up in the greater Seattle area is John. What's going on, John? Not much. I think for the first time ever... Uh, our words probably better than yours. <laughs> hey, you know what though? It's uh, the crazy. It's starting to get into the cra- crazy season down here, so I'll take it. And like every week, joining us from the San Francisco Bay Area is Jenna. What's going on, Jenna? N- nothing much. I mean, I don't think anyone beats our weather, but it's actually kind of rainy. So, John, give it back. I want that sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> So we're just going to jump right into it. This is the second part of the pilot episode. So we broke that up into two episodes because it's, it's really is two, 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 two episodes. And so we've already covered the first half. We're going to jump right in. This is a really important episode, not just for the series, but really for TV in general. Like this, you know, back in 1983, when this show first came out, it was you know, kind of defined what TV was going to be for the next 10 years. So let's just jump into it. We're going to begin the episode with they come we we kick kick it off right away. They're in the opening scene. They're in a they're going up to the hotel room, and Tubbs and Crockett are really starting to like develop their relationship. They're kind of you know getting buddy buddy. They're feeling good about each other, and they come into the room into the hotel room, and it's been trashed. And so, you know, of course, it's like the 80s cop show where it's like that we don't need a warrant anymore. So they just bust right into the hotel room or the the the, the apartment and they get some time to look around and see what's going on. And this is when we find out a little bit more information about our buddy Crockett. We find out that he was a college football star for the University of Florida. Yeah, yeah. he was a star wide receiver. And uh, I I don't know. I don't see the wide receiver. I think why not? If you're going to shoot for being a army veteran and a star football player, go quarterback. <laughs> yeah, I know. And he looks like a Miami kind of quarterback, doesn't he? He has that kind of <laughs> flashy, small build. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he actually the does writers. look a lot. Um, he actually does look a lot like, um, oh, uh, Doug Flutie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, it's Flutie magic. He's even got the hair for it. <laughs> so while there, while Tubbs is kind of grilling him on all these things that he apparently just rediscovers that, or makes a connection, I guess, that the the Crockett that he's met is also the same Crockett that he knows as the football star. Crockett's cracking open a Coors Light, isn't it like? I don't know, noon, maybe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's some, they're, they're on assignment in some dude's apartment. Like, it's not even that he's drinking because he's undercover or anything. But, it, no, he's just, you know, going to have a beer, hang out. It's another point, too, where, like, Tubbs is kind of more self-aware, or not self-aware, but just aware of scenarios in general than Crockett is. Crockett's a little slow on the uptake. You know, we find out in this episode that Tubbs, Raphael Tubbs, is not Raphael Tubbs, right? And it takes Crockett, you know, a while to figure that out. You know, and yeah, he's got to do some investigation, but and he kind of feels something. Like, Tubbs, man, he's right on it. He hears Crockett, he hears, you know, and then they went to Ford, it's like, you're that dude that played football. Uh huh. It seems like to me like a kind of guy that would wear a beer cozy around his neck. <laughs> <laughs> Foam sunglass holders that go around the back, you know, with like the, the sunglasses that are flat on top, and then got the uh, you know, the uh, aerodynamic uh-huh. design on the bottom. Oh, so you mean dad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> okay, so but, we hey, leave. Did, mm-hmm. Can I ask you? Um, so. It's uh, Raphael and Ricardo Tubbs. Mm-hmm. Um, what are they supposed to be? Uh, Haitian, Cuban? Like yeah. Make Puerto them Rican? on. I mean, Ricardo and Raphael, um, uh, you know, and they're from New York. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. To put what it together. The, that might come 
out in future episodes where we find a little bit out a little bit more about Tubbs's background. You know, because like they're both cops, and so if I have to guess from TV, they probably come from a cop family. Mm hmm. But they, yeah, but they're, they're clearly they clearly name those characters so that they have some sort of Latin influence. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. with the show being set in Miami, that makes sense. You know, um, their characters coming from New York, and I, I'm not sure, but um, I'm just curious how that's going to tie in because I'm assuming that has to tie in at some point. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you. you you know, if they didn't want that to tie in, they would have named them Bill and Bob. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when they leave from there, you know, they go back to, to the precinct office and uh, Crockett gives Gina some film to develop and tells her to check on, you know, Raphael Tubbs. And this is where, you know, we start to see that Crockett's having, he's like, eh, I don't know, something's a little off about Tubbs. We got to find out, see if we can see some more information. And then after that, which is, you know, important, but, you know, not really a long scene, we cut to uh, them meeting. The, they finally have that meeting with Trini DeSoto. They're meeting at a restaurant, and this is the man they're going to facilitate this big buy with. And this scene uh, is really important because it's going to come up. A, this character is going to come up a couple of times. And spoiler, the same actor will appear in a different role later in the show. Uh, That's not weird uh, at all. <laughs> um, uh -huh. And it's also Fredo, which I can't get out notice. of my head. I cannot get out of my head that it's that it's Fredo from The Godfather. Like as soon as I saw him, I pictured uh -huh. in my mind the scene where they're closing the door in the in the original Godfather and shutting Fredo out. Uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I, I just keep it about what what was it? Was it number three? Um. Or is it is it two or three when he uh, goes down? He's in. He's got Fredo in Vegas. That's two. Yeah, he has to. That's he has two. To kill him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's two. Yeah. Spoiler alert: yeah, Godfather Two. If you haven't seen it in forty years. Uh huh. No, I keep thinking about the scene when he goes down. Uh, when he goes down and visits Fredo in Vegas, and you know he's giving him crap for talking about the family to to behind his back. He's like smacking him around. <laughs> yeah and can we talk for just a couple of minutes with i'm just gonna call him fredo i know his name is so i'm just gonna call him fredo can we talk about fredo's accent oh uh -huh. but i mean you're not a fan i thought it was <laughs> it was so good he's I cuban mean, b look, look hold on because we need to address the fact that accents on the show are just awful because yeah. like, we've got oh. rico over here with his poor jamaican accent so yeah. i feel like I feel like Fredo does a pretty good job with his kind of mock Cuban. I don't know what he's going well, for. I could not really understand him. It looks you like know? the way accent. he's going to get the Cuban accent is he's just going to talk through his teeth. He's not going to open his mouth all the way. Yeah, and you know mm -hmm. what's so funny is that the, the accent, accent is, is so just bad. An... And he's going on and on about how classic television taught him mm -hmm. how to speak English so well. And yet you yeah. can't really understand him at all because he, he, I mean, I guess he's saying the words just fine, but he's putting them through his teeth. So you can't hear him. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so for, ahead, for at least in my opinion, um, what I think what makes the accent worst is that horrible spray tan. They have <laughs> <Yeah>. him, <laughs> you know, because yeah. like they've got the spray tan and he's got the gold tennis bracelet and, uh, yeah. like the 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 shirt with the uh unbuttoned so you can see the chest hair. Yeah, you know. <laughs> also, just like he's my, so I'm, stereotypical. I'm, I'm having like a mind blown moment. It's like, wait a minute. Yeah, they talk about I love Lucy in that, and uh, he talks about Desi Arnaz. His name is Ricky Ricardo. Yes, and then Tubbs' his real name. It, it, what what's his real first name again? It's it's Re, Ricardo, right? Ricardo, yeah. Oh yeah, my Ricardo god, Tubbs. Illuminati has been proven. <laughs> <laughs> I did think that that comment, by the way. I mean, yes. So that's that feels like a very meta kind of moment. But <laughs> um, I felt like that comment was pretty good because there he's totally shitting on modern television and how mm -hmm. poor quality it is and how it's nothing like classic TV. And then he makes a total comment about how like uh, the Academy is such shit because Desi Arnaz never won an Academy Award. Yeah. 
and it felt and he's know, doing felt, a Desi like Arnaz impression. Company. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's almost like he's trying to talk like 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 an over the top Ar- Arnaz. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So yes. like you keep expecting him to say Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> so in that scene, you know, they're working out like this. What ends up being, you know, it's going to be a really big uh, Coke exchange, and again. Crockett's only benefit he can add to this conversation is he's got a badass boat. <laughs> he's got a boat. Doesn't doesn't uh doesn't Fredo even call him out on it where he's he's like, and and why like what's your stake in this? Why yeah. are you why are you even part of this? Uh-huh. <laughs> what do you yeah. get out of it? <laughs> and re, and Dude, I'm again, telling you, man. to be like, oh well, he's got the boat. <laughs> he's got a boat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Crockett's lucky, man. Apparently, he's the only guy with a speedboat in, in the in the keys, man. If if yeah. another guy moves in, he's screwed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Damn it, Billy's got a faster boat than Crockett does. Now we can never go undercover again. <laughs> I mean, it's. I know we're gonna get into this in future episodes because, like, I think Sunny keeps this role. But it's like, if the only thing you bring is that you got a fast boat and everyone you work a deal out with ends up dead or arrested, <laughs> it might be time to find some new boat. Uh-huh. Maybe your boat ain't yeah. as badass as you said it is. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, dude, uh, I'm still amazed. He he doesn't try and be undercover at all. He's the most. He's the least undercover person possible. <laughs> Because he okay. actually lives on a boat. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just wondering, do, and and this is this is just a very I probably am, am not picking up on it kind of comment. But so he lives on a boat, but that's not the boat that he is using. No. <laughs> he's using for, like he's not like. No, that's are, a different. He's boat. not asking people to like step around Elvis or like sorry yeah. about the bed not being made while we make this drug deal. <laughs> uh. So, so he actually has two boats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Where does he keep the other uh, boat? <laughs> exactly, because exactly. it's, it's it's not tied up in the dock. Um, <laughs> it's like it's like Grand Theft Auto. He just like he holds down R one and he's like uses the D pad to go over, and then the boat just drops down in the water. And sometimes it gets really fucked up uh-huh. because you're over a land, and then the boat just drops on the land. Do you think that was his boat that Crockett was driving earlier in the episode? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's his boat. That's why uh, when Tubbs takes off on it earlier, that's what – I mean, it's, it's a, such a badass boat, but Crockett's able to run him down in his car while uh-huh. his badass boat yeah. is going on the water. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Again, if it's the I'm pretty sure they didn't have GPS for. back then. So <laughs> Yeah. So uh, they work out their deal, and – DeSoto says to meet him at, 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 at the club later. And so Tubbs and Crockett leave and driving back from the restaurant, Tubbs finally, you know, starts to say like, Hey, there's a mole as he had mentioned before. And I think the mole might be Lieutenant Rodriguez and Crockett takes that really personal. It's kind of a really quick scene, but you know, you see Crockett does is, I guess it's just to say that Crockett won't believe in anyone that he knows really well. Personally could be the mole in the police department. So later they make it to the the club and this is we're going to sp- sp- spend some time on this scene. They make it to the club and there's a live band playing and they're playing Lionel Richie's All Night Long. We'll come back to that in a minute. Gina's there with Crockett so they got uh girls Crockett and girl Tubbs are there with yes. them. Uh, who, Gina who, and Trudy, by the way, okay, just okay. In, just in case. Female Crockett, male Tubbs. We covered this. <laughs> so Gina and Trudy are there, and once again, they have like no talking lines. Gina will have some later, but you know they're just kind of there. And uh, Soto shows up, and he is like coked out of his mind. Yeah, he even says. <laughs> Don't mind me, man. I'm on four days running. After <laughs> yeah. rambling for where they're just kind of like, uh, <laughs> what? Yeah. It's almost like like this man was Fredo and the Godfather. Let's just let him go. And he just kept talking. He just kept talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. Yeah, I get this sense that mm-hmm. they just kind of let him ad lib and, and, and just try some stuff out while, yeah. <laughs> while recording. And just like, uh, just keep it in. That fits. Yeah. <laughs> so they work out their deal for a whole bunch of coke 
and uh yeah they're gonna retire after this yeah exactly and then Tubbs is adamant like you told me that calderon was gonna be here and they can see across the club that there's uh that calderon is there and so Tubbs starts walking across the dance floor and he's having like flashbacks of all the people he knows that Keldron has been a part of that that has killed. And so he's trying to like, you know, subside his anger so he doesn't just when he, he doesn't just kill him when when he gets over there. And so he's just going over there to tell him that he's you know excited to do business with him, whatever. So I don't know, some awkward scene. Let's talk about hold on, hold on, hold yeah. on. So while he's walking over there. Like Crockett's freaking out trying to get across the club to stop him because he thinks he's gonna do something. Mm-hmm. Um uh he thinks Tubbs is gonna do something. Can we just talk about how how kind of awkward it is, how the whole time he's out he's walking toward him, he's like staring him at Calderon in the eye. Yeah. You know? Can we and then can he, gets, we mention- he walks up to him, walks up to his table, and he just stands there and stares at him for like a minute. <laughs> right, exactly. Like Tubbs has total dead eyes, where yeah. he's got that kind of blank stare. Which I just coming to watch a couple of these episodes. That's a trademark Tubbs look. That yeah. he's got this like derp blank face going on, <laughs> and I feel as someone <laughs> of an expert in the derp face, like I have fallen prey to that so many times. But it's got to be super awkward. If I was Calderon, I, even when he passes the champagne over and they're looking at each other across the dance floor and mm-hmm. Tubbs doesn't even try to smile or wave or anything. He just stares at him with these totally just blank look like he yeah. can't focus on anything. And it's an intense scene. You know, <laughs> like this is really setting up like uh, who Tubbs is and, and that he's that way. Right. When he's not at work. He, you know, he's a womanizer and he likes to have fun and dance and, you know, stuff like that. But then when it comes to being a detective, especially at going after Calderon, he's super intense. And so the scene is is really important for the show. And uh, it, it, well, it's a super intense scene for Tubbs. But at the time, Calderon um, is getting drunk and partying. Yeah. So I'm just saying from his, from his perspective, it's kind of strange. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about Lionel Richie's All Night Long, which is what the cover band is playing as Tubbs is walking across the dance floor in this scene. And I specifically want to talk more about the music video that goes with this. And we talked about before, like Miami Vice is what made, what made it different is that they had popular music at the time that they put it right into the show so that it can pull in a younger audience and you can hear, you know, what was popular, which really there really isn't much or any shows that are like that anymore. But the 80s, when it comes to music videos, are very, very unique on how they did their music videos. Well, I think first, we before we dive too much into the music video, we should acknowledge that a Freddie Mercury lookalike is the lead singer of the cover band that's singing <laughs> the Lionel Richie song. <laughs> so, and I don't know what happened to Blondie that was singing before, but all of a sudden this guy comes out and starts singing the, the rest of the song. And did you notice that everyone on the dance floor is wearing white? Yeah. Yeah. So was it like a theme night, or is that just a Miami <laughs> thing? Or <laughs> it, it, it's not Labor Day yet, so <laughs> yeah. right, right. So let's talk about Lionel Richie, and let's be honest. He is one of the weirdest looking men I have ever seen. His face is so long, <laughs> dude. And it's just so weird. Like seeing him rocking that mustache. Yeah, and that's you know, and that's eighties, right? Like the mustache was the thing. And is nowhere near. Like I try and wear a mustache every once in a while and I have like women grabbing their children and running to their car. You know, it's like it is not it is yes. not seen the same way as it was back then. Yeah, because ninety percent of mustaches yeah. end up like crockets and you just look like a pedophile. <laughs> okay, not everyone can pull uh, a Tom Selleck mustache. Uh, so <laughs> The set is for this music video. It looks like it's a cross between a fake Western, like where you go to like one of those fake Western towns and they do like the fake shootouts in the street, and then like the old set from a West Side Story. So yeah, it's like see, that's, weird that's mix. That well, was my con. Was I was like, uh, when you first posted the music video, I was like, this is like watching a really bad production of a streetcar named Desire. Yeah. Well, you, you know, know what it reminded like, me of was the opposite 
the opposites attract to the Paula Abdul movie oh, yeah. video where she's with the cartoon cat. <laughs> yeah. Like that's kind of I was expecting uh, Lionel to just start all of a sudden like start dancing with some animated animal. Yeah. See, and I have uh, I I went along the same theme, but I I'm watching it like were they filming an episode of like Sesame Street and they all just broke out in a dance? <laughs> Cuz I mean like you you have like you yeah, know you, and uh, that's really dress that come out dancing. Yeah, and, and this, then the kids come out, and, and you know, and, and the kids are it, it's cute, like, you know, and they're dancing, you know, and, and like the dancing from there, all and the dancing in the front is always really good, right? They got good dancers in the front, but you watch uh-huh. the people in the background, and it's like it's like uh, they're not even paying attention; they're like looking the other way, you know, like scratching themselves, and like only the people yeah, in the very front yeah, are the dude, ones that are paying attention. It's like they were filming some sort of educational show, and then like in the middle of it, they were like, "Everybody dance now." Oh. <laughs> you know, um, and they're like, that was so cool. We're going to use this as our music video for an <laughs> awful, awful song. <laughs> you know, there might be some people that will attack you on the on on the actual song, because every time I hear this song, I cannot get it out of my head. It's so good. Like Even when they started singing it while I was watching the episode, I started dancing. It's just so <laughs> catchy. Uh, I wonder why they decided to I don't have know. I mean, it be a cover song in the episode. Like why they must not have been able – like they still had to pay for the rights to, be, to, to do the cover. I wonder why they didn't do – well, I guess I guess never mind. They, they're in the club. Like Lionel Richie's not actually going to be there. Well, right. And okay, I mean it let- was still a fairly – like it was a pilot episode, so they probably didn't want to blow the budget. Lionel Richie strikes me as someone that you would have to blow – the budget on mm-hmm. that yeah, you would true. demand like way too much to be involved true very let, true let me let, let me just justify my comment on the song here mm-hmm. okay um when it comes to lionel Richie, i don't think i think of the love songs and stuff that uh, a part of his catalog this song to me as far as his catalog this is kind of his effort phase mm-hmm. you know this is kind of you of you know, it, it's like when the lead singer of a band makes a makes their own uh uh goes out and makes their own solo album. Well, that's you know, essentially it, what, it's, what what that's that's lot Lionel Richie at this time, right? Because he was in the Commodores before yeah. then, and now he's you know he's he's on his own and and he's making his own solo stuff. Yeah, and what I'm and what what I'm saying is that Lionel Richie and the Commodores was was really good. Lionel Richie when he went this phase. Was completely awful. <laughs> How dare you, sir? Because that song is amazing. <laughs> All right, that I'm sums up saying. music video time in Miami Vice. Um, and by the way, pastels are awful. <laughs> hey, yo, no, that's so. That's hundred percent true for this music video and to the episode of Miami Vice is that they actually fit really well together, right? You know the the yes. the way the music video looks and the way the colors and stuff like that. Miami Vice they fit re, 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 really well together. Yeah, so many pinks and purples, and it's like a mm-hmm. Crayola box exploded. <laughs> so we uh, Tubbs goes and talks to Calderon. They have their awkward exchange, and then Tubbs and Trudy leave, and then Gina and and Crockett leave together, and we go to the scene where we're on Crockett's uh, houseboat, not his speedboat. Well, you should yes. mention that right before they choose to leave, Gina it asks about his name and blows it to, uh, to Crockett that he's not Raphael Tubbs. Raphael Tubbs has been dead for three weeks. So that last that last scene in the club is when Crockett finds out that Rico is not Raphael. Oh yeah, that's right. That is what happens there. That Gina, Gina, mm-hmm. that they have that exchange, and she says like, "No, Ra- Raphael Tubbs has been dead for has been dead for three weeks." Exactly. And, and so then, right, right, right. So they 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 go from the club, and not one of them thinks like we should chase him down and save Trudy because we don't know who this weirdo <laughs> is. Well, uh-huh. in, in fact, and when they get on the boat, Gina's like, well, what are you going to do? Stake out at his hotel room? Nothing we can do now. <laughs> Except for save Trudy. Who is this man? <laughs> yes. And Crockett's yes. so upset. He's By just the way, rambling acronyms. Who is he? CIA? DEA? IRS? 
<laughs> uh, <laughs> IRS, FCC. <laughs> yeah, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> uh, which, by the way, that in that scene, that is female Tubbs's only speaking scene. I can True. Right somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> that is the only time they let her talk. Yeah, so, I, so, I so that's like, and that's like, you put it all together. It's like they're like, oh fuck, Trudy's dead. <laughs> yes. Well, we should probably phone now on my, on my houseboat. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so they make it to Sonny's boat. And there's Sonny's really worked up about, you know, like, I don't know who this Tubbs guy is. And, and you know, who is he? And he says he worked for the IRS. You know, and, <laughs> and he all of a sudden, he hits this moment of zen. Like, oh, damn. Actually, Gina, girl, I kind of want to bone you down right now. And uh-huh. he really, like, he just, like, it's like a switch. You come see my on. boat? <laughs> yeah. And he, like, he, like, lays it on real thick, like, awkwardly thick. He's, like, laying it on, like, don't you want to stay the night? Like, you know, aren't have, and, and that's what you're talking about, Jen. It's like, you feel like they've, this has been set up for a while now because they've been working so closely together for many years that it's finally bubbling up that, that, you know, this is going to be the time because they had been kind of flirting with each other be before this exactly and okay so there is plenty to be to make fun of or whatever in this scene but i think it's also really important him and gina have that conversation about how hard it is to be married and and when you're in this line of work and she asks him if it's hard i think she says something like hard to hard to like remember who you need to be and he like scoffs and says darling sometimes i remember who i am and i feel like that's a very trademark moment for sunny and who he's going to be throughout the series that he's this person who's like kind of constantly running away from who he actually is and trying to be something else all the time Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it just it felt let's just be realistic here let's just Let's just be realistic here. She has been uh, watching Crockett for a long time, waiting to pounce. <laughs> and after now that he's divorced, she waited the appropriate time, got him on the boat. Now she's ready for something hard. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that because, like, he lays it on so thick. He's so pathetic. While he's while he's talking to her, that she's almost like like I don't know. He's a pretty sad puppy dog. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm interested in the way that we see this so differently because I see Gina as a really strong female character, and she's actively trying to not engage Sunny in all of his antics while he's while he's shamelessly flirting with her and trying to get her to I don't know where the fuck Elvis is by the way, but he's trying to get her to to go to bed with him, and she's like no. No, oh, and I I get you. Like I feel like we're on a similar level, but no, we need to not we need to not go there. Mhm. Mhm. So and female Crockett to me right now, female Crockett to me right now is nothing more than a booty call. <laughs> well, night I mean, fighter starts well, let, cutting off lights as they're going to bed. Let's let's go back to that because they're gonna have a conversation later, right? And then we'll we'll, we'll be able to sum that up. So you know, we we cut to the scene where. The next morning where Crockett wakes up and Gina's gone. You know, she's left. He calls out to her, but but she's gone. And once again, Tubbs is, you know, he's been up since like freaking crack at dawn. He's walking on the road, whistling, talking to women as he's walking up. And drunk ass Crockett can barely wake his ass up by, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning. And so, but uh, somehow Crockett, because he had, he had woken up, he hears Tubbs coming. And this is where we find out the big spoiler in the show, right? Tubbs comes down in and... Crockett grabs him and throws him against the wall, and he's got a flare gun. He doesn't have his regular gun. He's got a flare gun. Yes. You know, true Crockett style, think, unprepared. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, which I think is hilarious. Yeah, I'm going to shoot you with a flare gun in the cabin <laughs> of a boat. <laughs> yeah, in, in an enclosed <laughs> This space. couldn't go wrong at all. This is a suicide mission. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> We're all going to die unless you tell me who you really are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think we can all agree that Crockett's not much of a forward thinker, okay? <laughs> no, no. And so yeah, they doesn't have... seem to plan this out. Yep. So, so t- uh, Crockett finally forces Tubbs to admit he is not Raphael Tubbs. Raphael Tubbs died, who's his brother, died three weeks before and was a great de- And Ricardo Tubbs, who Tubbs really is, is a street cop from San Francisco, uh, San Francisco, from New York. And 
he's out to get vengeance for Calderon killing his brother. He is a detective. He's not a street cop. He actually is oh. a detective, but he's in I no, thought he's he was in a drug uh, enforcement robbery. Thing. Oh. No, no, he's in robbery and um uh he's a detective in robbery, not homicide or or drugs or vice. Mm-hmm. He's in uh I-, I can't remember what the other robbery, like for like burglary, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Like that's what he's a detective in. So hmm. Hmm. so he but- has no experience in vice, actually. That's what we learn. Yeah. But he's um, a critical which explains part the to them being to able to him. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it's also it's he's he's key right he, that's the and he tells crockett this like he's the only way that he's got a connection to calderon right now because the deal is with tubs yes which coincidentally triggers tubs. the phone call yep yep exactly so uh they uh let me look at here so they have to they cut to the police station and Crockett's so that they, they, they work it out and they, they decide they find out that phone call is where they can, they set up the next meeting with uh De Soto, right. To go meet him at the club. Like what, what time to meet, meet, meet him at the club or something. I'm blanking yeah. out on what that phone call was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, well, so if you remember the night before De Soto high out of his mind, but says, if you are going to hear from us, you'll hear from us the next day. Ah, and okay. he's like, yeah, call us on the boat phone. <laughs> 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 and, you'll, and you'll get through. So that's, that's what that phone call is, is them calling to like actually set up the time of the deal. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. So they leave from there and Crockett goes back to the police station and Tubbs stays there with Elvis. And at the police station, Crockett approaches Lieutenant Rodriguez and says, just giving him a rundown on what's happening with the case. And then Rodriguez lets out that he's paying for his son to go to a really expensive uh, school. And Crockett's like, uh, where'd you get that money? And they have this great exchange where Sonny's like, where, where Sonny's asking about it and, and Lieutenant Rodriguez is just like, go ahead. Ask me how I got the money. Yeah. Me. And yeah. so none of and, your business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's none of your business, man. <laughs> so yeah. who who actually says that in real life? Yeah, I know. And you see, like Crockett, he's starting to believe in what Tubbs is saying. It's like it might be someone close to him, but he still doesn't suspect who the mole actually is because he he just can't fathom it in his own head that it might be someone really close to him. And then I would which, take which some time. Apparently, uh, apparently, telling him to mind his own business worked because um, yeah, never asked. He, he seemed to give up on the fact that okay, it's not him. Yeah. He can't be the mole because he said none of my business. <laughs> yeah, like, right. And I think just it'll be completely interesting. gave up on that scenario. <laughs> I think it'll be interesting to see like what of it comes up later, um, because obviously we're going to get into the rest of the mole situation, but. Uh, I think that this also just goes back to Crockett's sort of trustworthy, like, I want to see the best in the people that I care about kind of mm-hmm. mentality. Mm-hmm. So, And that might explain why. Lazy. <laughs> yeah, not a very good detective. But that also might be why, Jenna, that yes. he, uh, why he believes Tubbs so quickly, too, right? Like, they just immediately start being best friends. Right, exactly. <laughs> I, like, he's just kind of, he seems like a trustworthy kind of guy, you know? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So... They go to so sorry. So I want to take a moment to talk about. It's been like a whirlwind few days for Tubbs and Crockett. I want to take this moment to talk about how amazing Crockett's hair is because it is. It's totally amazing. It's it never moves. It's always perfect. It's shiny. He has like like I'm starting to grow my hair out. I kind of want a Crockett haircut. Please don't get a Crockett uh, haircut. <laughs> for Melissa's sake, please don't get a Crockett. Actually, for Melissa's sake, please get a Crockett haircut, knowing that yeah. she's like a huge fan. Um, uh, no, I, like, I completely agree. His hair is – it's its a thing to be awed by, right? <laughs> and, and what's strange to me is that it looks like if you saw him in person that his hair would actually be really thin. Mm-hmm. And it must have taken a lot for the stylist to just get it to go in the right way. But yeah, it's got this like perfect sheen. He's got to like it. that that flip, and it's always yeah. right above the one eye, you know. So it's like like uh-huh. like so like he could be serious, See? and then he sees the lady, and he could flip his hair, and that curl kind of hangs over the left eye there, and he's like, "What's up, ladies? 
and they Crockett's go back to being so serious. Dreamy. <laughs> See, I think Jenna, I think Jenna hit the nail on the head. I think the stylist was trying so hard for like a flock of seagulls thing, but couldn't get it to stand <laughs> up because of how thin it was. And so, like, this was the best attempt they could make. <laughs> right. Like, so, like, flipped up over one eye, like glued to his head. We'll get into you know, the. We'll get into later episodes with people who have uh, the hairstyle that's a little bit more crazy than that, like a little bit mm-hmm. closer to that flock of seagulls style. And I think that that might be what they're going for, and, <laughs> and that Don Johnson's hair just wasn't going to do it. Yeah, it just didn't I don't know. cooperate. It's- there was a very frustrated stylist on the set. <laughs> it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful distraction from his super pervy mustache. So, <laughs> yeah. and it, every time I see him. You know, I, they, they go to Crockett and I see it. It's like this brownish yellow halo is hovering over Crockett of like, oh, I can trust you, Sonny. What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Crockett's there to talk about, uh, you know, to talk to the, 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 the other detectives on police force. What's going to happen? Because they're setting up the deal that's going to happen tonight. And so, but in between then, he sees Gina. So we're just ha- going to skip Oh, okay. Now, now, I thought we were yeah. just going to skip over uh, female Crockett getting all moody. No, 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 no. So he sees Gina and he finally asks her like, hey, so you took off earlier in the morning. What's going on? She's really pissed off at him. Yeah, see, I mean, she has like, every right this, to be. Yeah, see, well, I mean, at this point, I I didn't catch the fact that he called her by his wife's name. Um, and apparently he was so drunk, he didn't catch it either. Mm-hmm. So the whole time they're arguing in the bathroom, I thought she was just being really moody. I was thinking like, well, maybe it's just her. <laughs> and, John, you know, and you female can't tubs see me, but that I am comes in. You so hard and I right think now. female tubs got the same vibe. <laughs> I think female tubs got because she doesn't say anything like always. She just turns around <laughs> and leaves. <laughs> Well, when you walk in to use the red baby, maybe Trudy really needed to go to the bathroom and wanted some privacy. <laughs> you walk in, yeah. you, you walk she into had a to crowded do. bathroom. You know, she had to do, but she didn't want to do it with with Crockett and female Crockett there. <laughs> yeah, I, and it's like a total '80s trope, right? Like she's mad at him, so she just goes into the bathroom, and Crockett is like. <sighs> And he's just busts into the bathroom so so he, he can find out what's going on. You know, and like they're just hanging out in the bathroom. I, I, I kinda wanted to talk about that for a moment. Is that you if you watch shows in the eighties, nineties, and then today, uh, like you said, like it's the total eighties trope, guy follows girl into the women's bathroom. Mm-hmm. Um, but you'll notice at a certain point that that trend continues from the eighties to the nineties, and at a certain point that role switches because nowadays in shows, you don't see the guy follow the girl into the bathroom. You see the girl follow the guy into the guy's bathroom now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The roles have kind of been flipped. And I think part of that is that, you know, uh, is that uh, I don't think shows want to show the guy bursting into the female bathroom anymore. I think they uh, the culturally, it's more acceptable now if it's a girl going into the man's bathroom. Yeah, I mean... I think what it is is that just TV shows now are trying to show stronger female characters, you know? So, like, and yeah. f- from this era, it's like, you know, the men, men are the strong ones. And so they do, they're the ones that have to do that kind of stuff. And nowadays, they're trying to show women in a stronger role. And right, so, like, that might be mm-hmm. so if you think about it, the, the whole running into the bathroom and the other person chasing you into it, it signifies that one one party is running away from the problem and and then the other has to like confront the conflict, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas now, sort of to Dominic's point, I think that they're trying to reverse it a little bit where it's not just the woman trying to run away from the problem and the man has to be strong well, I mean, and confront it. That's kind of my it, point. It's the other way. So after that scene, uh, Crockett is still putting together that uh his detectives and the police for what's going to happen at that bus that night and tubs gets a call from to say that the meeting has been moved up it's not going to happen that night anymore it's going to happen in 10 minutes you need to go meet me in this alley over here at the same time crocky gets a list at the end of his meeting like hey this we got, we got this call from someone named tubs which apparently there's people in that office who don't know what who don't know who he is yet and this special case that's going on that requires a meeting full of detectives and police officers but the guy comes up and says hey about 20 minutes ago this guy named tubs called and said you know and said the meeting had been bumped up and then he also had the list 
of all the phone calls that Calderon had made. And on there is his ex-partner, Scott Wheeler, who ne- we have now identified is the mole in the in, in the police department. Which, how did Dubs, a cop out of jurisdiction, uh, get that list of phone calls before anyone in that meeting of actual detectives in Florida? You, yeah. you see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. How, how did Tubbs get the list before everybody else? How did he get the phone call list when he's not even supposed to be working on the case because yet again rico's the only one actually doing his job or i guess arguably in this like not what should be his job but he's the only one showing any reasonable skill as a detective the because as as dominic pointed out scott wheeler called from his own phone it's yeah bloody. he wasn't even making it hard for someone to find like he wasn't being secretive about it it was in plain view and just nobody uh-huh. was looking it's as if scott wheeler a detective had no idea how the police do their work right yeah yeah hey hey calderon call me at this number i'm extension 213 <laughs> yeah. um if if i'm not there leave leave a message with the desk sergeant he'll get me the message about the illegal me <laughs> yeah so so Crockett runs out and he's going to go, you know, he needs to go help Tubbs. Tubbs is in danger. He's been set up. There's a, they know that Tubbs is a police officer. He is not a Jamaican man. He is a police officer. <laughs> and we cut to the scene with Tubbs. who's standing in the alley and a woman, woman walked down the road and you see from the close up, it's the same woman. Now, that I, thought shot that and- scene, I thought that scene was after he goes and confronts his old partner. Uh no, that should be after. No, it's right? bef- it's before he yeah. confronts Scott. Oh, it is. He he confronts Scott after. Yeah, yeah. So Tubbs is standing there, and you get the camera close up, and it's clearly the same person who shot and killed their first witness in the first half of of the episode, right? That shot him at, down down at the beach where they try to do that setup where he had given some plea deal and for information to to be released, and they couldn't protect him. And he's mm-hmm. wearing the same outfit, comes walking up, and this this woman is like. Six foot five. Yes. And, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so woman comes up and asks Tubbs something and looks him right in the eye. Like they they see each other face to face. Then the, the woman goes walking a little bit further, turns and looks, and you see full camera. It's clearly Trini DeSoto or Fredo. It's clearly them. There's no confusing it. <laughs> I don't know how Tubbs didn't recognize their connection for this Coke deal. All white people look the same. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can think. All white people look the same. <laughs> Damn it, just another honky in the dress. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, maybe he maybe he was just so caught up thinking that someone was hitting on him because he's been played out to be this womanizer, right? So, he's, mm-hmm, oh, no, mm-hmm. honey, honey, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Yeah, so right then, Trini pulls out a gun and try, and, and then police officers show up. And Trini turns, shoots at one off at one car, shoots at another, and then finally, Tubbs pulls his head out of his ass, pulls his gun yeah. out, and shoots and kills Trini. Right after it is like the slowest action ever. Right, and it's like he's just standing there with this shocked look. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Tubbs the drag queen there, gets like the like, uh, uh, oh yeah, bang bang. <laughs> Uh-huh. Uh, the 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 gun scenes in this show are a bit laughable and and I'm being generous here because <laughs> it seems as though nobody can hit the broadside of a barn. Like <laughs> yeah. there are people who are standing in plain sight. And and I'm just surprised. Yeah. Like in this scene, I'm just surprised that Tubbs doesn't get hit by like a stray bullet. People are firing all over the place and it's a fairly yeah. narrow alley. And he's yeah. just standing there. He's not even trying to like shrink down or go near the wall or pull and, his gun and out. And why and why is Fredo shooting past the only person that can actually shoot him in the alley at the guys in the cop car? <laughs> We haven't even got out of the car yet. Well, yeah, I mean, he's got one job, right? His job is supposed to kill Tubbs. But when the police officers show up, yes. that just goes out the window. Yeah. Like, why doesn't he just shoot Tubbs and then run? Yeah. <laughs> it's, I, 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 get, I, I guess running in heels is, out of, is not an option at this point. But, I mean, he gets killed by Tubbs, but he fires like three bullets at the cop cars before this. And he gets killed by the only person in the alley who he's supposed to kill. Yeah. Who could shoot him back. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it's not until he falls over dead and the wig falls off that everybody's like, oh, oh look who oh. it is. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, they're pretty really cool about the fact that an out of uh, an out of jurisdiction police officer who does not have authority to be on this case just murdered someone in their town. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that like, could go totally crazy. cool, man. Like, pe- like off uh, off duty cops from other states come here and shoot people all the time. But that just goes for the whole show in general, because you know that at some point they're going to have to address the fact that he isn't who he said that he is, and he's come down. And, like, so he's had to probably forge a number of documents and and lie to multiple police departments. Mm-hmm. So, and yet, well, and he, and he even well. jokes about it at the end. And he even jokes about it at the end of the episode um, about how he's going to go back and they're going to fire him for everything he's done. Yeah, I just I feel like because of how Tubbs is and all the stuff that he gets on into to try and get revenge, like someone's finally going to ask him for ID. He's like, I got your ID right here. He pulls out his wallet real slow. I got a license to kill. So uh-huh. we leave from uh, there and we finally get the scene where Crockett, is he's uh, going to call out Scott Wheeler for being the mole. And he goes over to Scott's house. And Scott, he's in a bad financial spot. They open up the door and you see that he's got a child in a wheelchair and you know immediately like oh this is why scott was doing this he needed money he's got there's that he's got a sick kid that he's got to take care of and that's what it ends up being they sunny and and scott walk out to his car and they start talking and he finally gets it out of him he's like i was you know he's three mortgage payments behind on his house and they spent you know more than his annual pay for taking care of his son and that's why he was giving information to Calderon. There always seems to be a little Timmy with a bum knee, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Which I think Crockett's a pretty crappy ex-partner. If, like, he didn't know that his, that his former partner was three three months behind on his mortgage and, you know, way, uh, way in debt because of his crippled son. Like... <laughs> Well, I, hold on, because the they show if you look at the at part one of the pilot, the wheelchair is in the scene when they're at the birthday party. The kid's just not in. That's it. true. That's so, true. So, like, it it seems to me as though it's something that they're well aware of the kid's health issues, and they're just not aware of the impact that it's making on the Wheeler family. So, mm-hmm. and that's where Sonny's like doubly get the rug pulled out from him because he, here he is. He thinks that he knows this guy for years and years and they're thick as thieves when in actuality, there's so much that he doesn't know about him. Yeah. And in the scene where he's talking to Gina on the boat, he tells her, Crockett tells her, it's like, look, when it comes to, no, it's with uh, Tubbs. He tells Tubbs, like, when it comes to being a cop, I am all business. And in this scene, you see that. Hey, it's his ex-partner. He knows he's got a bad family situation with his son being sick, but he is all business when it comes to being a cop, and he's and he's blowing the whistle on his ex-partner. He's not even going to give him a chance at getting out of this because right in that conversation, cop cop cars pull up too. But yeah, and we keep mentioning Fredo. Mm -hmm. And and we keep mentioning Fredo, and that scene totally felt like uh, the end of Godfather One, like. Give me one more chance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and, but Crockett's all business, right? And he's like, just, you know, like, basically, like, just tell me. Just tell me you did it. Just tell me you did it. And he finally comes clean. He's like, okay, is the deal? He gets out of him that 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 there's still an actual deal that's going to go down that night. And you see, like, Cro- like yeah, Crockett, you're all business, man. You're a cop. Good for you. You busted down your partner. You can't have any bad people out on, on your police force. And at the last second, Crockett lunges for the throat. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, but I mean, come on. He explains himself. He's he's angry. He's like, I had you in my house. I've had you with my family. Like, who are you? How could you betray me like that? You know, mm-hmm. very uh, et tu brute, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, once it's again, cool. goes only... once again, kind of goes back to him being a crappy friend and ex partner. Yeah. You know, but it would be cool too if it was only other police officers, right? <laughs> but when the camera pans out, there's clearly other people, just bystanders, watching a police officer get arrested while another police officer tries to choke him out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, but the the Miami PD we've already established is kind of a in the way more than they're helpful. So, 
Mm -hmm. They're probably just looking for something interesting to watch. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. we, we end that scene. They found the mole. Tubbs and Crockett can now go bust down Caldron. They know when the deal is happening. And we come to the cream of the crop, the quintessential scene from Miami Vice to define the decade that is 80s TV. Where we have uh, Crockett. I'm so excited. <laughs> we have Crockett yes. and Tubbs driving in his convertible at night in Miami. And Bill Collins in the air tonight is playing in the background. Strategically Again, volume and, and volumed low and, and uh, higher and lower depending on what's happening, especially when that when that jump bar happens. Do, 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 that really crank up the volume. On uh huh. It. Yes, and Crockett can feel it coming in the air tonight. <laughs> Again, <laughs> been waiting for this moment all his life, and I'm I willing to bet if Tubbs was drowning, he wouldn't lend a hand. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm telling you, completely quintessential Crockett scene or i guess a sort of set of scenes because it opens with him at the payphone calling mm -hmm. his ex-wife and asking her if it was real you know like if they really ever did love each other or if it was just problems all the time and she says you mm -hmm. know yeah it was real and there's still that kind of that hurt and that thread of hope and and you can see just how nuanced of a character he is in that moment and he's just so emotional which Looking back is is a pretty inappropriate time to make to, like to make that call. <laughs> like, well, like, he's, like he's very thoughtful, like white guy thinking time in the car on the way to do this deal. Well, yeah, and he's pissed. He's pissed. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, his ex partner has been given information to Calderon, and the deal is still going down. Tubbs was lying to him the whole time. He's not actually who he says he is. He fucked up with Gina, and that's going nowhere. He's fucking pissed. Someone's gonna die tonight. God damn it. Yeah, and, and can I just say that that scene with them driving and Phil Collins blaring, driving through my, the the nighttime in Miami, going to that deal. That is like up to this point. That this is my defining scene uh, of Miami Vice. You know, it is mm -hmm. so serious, and that so, and that song is so on point with mm -hmm. just how where the show is, is at the end of this episode. You know, this is what makes me excited for the rest of this show mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, moving forward. It's more is just how awesome that was, how 80s, but how on point Bill Collins in the air tonight, you know, with just the serious. They keep looking at each other. They're loading their guns like this is it. 80s mm -hmm. action movie. Well, yeah. and it's also got that kind of revival of that film noir kind of look to it and it, it just mm -hmm. it feels a little too well done for the for the campiness of the show in general but it's um something that i think they come back to a lot with the whole them driving and that kind of side angle where mm -hmm. Tubbs looks at crockett and crockett's looking ahead and mm -hmm. it, that that mm -hmm. in particular seems to be sort of a repetitive moment throughout the series yeah yeah, yeah. like i said that just seems to be like like defining quintessential this is what's gonna be miami vice moving forward yep yep they make it to the boat that's that not crock a special boat but this new boat really, that really quick mm -hmm. really quick i just want to point out that phil collins song actually the meaning to the lyrics of that song has no nothing to do with anything that could possibly be going on in this episode i don't think uh crockett or Tubbs is gonna let anybody drown <laughs> well, I guess you can see it we me can move metaphorically on. that they're like that Crockett's starting to feel like he's drowning under the weight of his life. Right. Yeah, but it's I also guess an I interactive scene because let's face it, I think anybody who's you know been alive at all throughout the you know eighties or beyond nailed that drum solo in the air drum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, that is an awesome like drum machine electric drum solo. Like you can you can hey, picture the hey. guy with the little pads plugged in. Exactly. Don't don't you for a second suggest that the amazing drummer that is Phil Collins use a drum machine for that moment. That it's real Phil Collins on a real drum set. By the way, I, I love Phil Collins. I forgot he was a drum. I forgot he was a drummer. I totally forgot about that. <laughs> it's, 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 it's who he is. <laughs> I you just picture him now as the is? as the chubby bald guy. Yeah I, yeah, I don't picture him with the long hair behind the drum set. You know. <laughs> oh, so you're thinking like 
Tarzan Phil Collins. Not, <laughs> yeah. not like Genesis Phil Collins. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Genesis Phil Collins, even though that's the cool Phil Collins, that doesn't immediately pop into my mind. Cool and Phil Collins uh, nowadays <laughs> seem to go together. For how much Jenna loves Sonny, I love Phil Collins. I want to have Phil Collins' baby. Oh, it's, it's a mutual thing. I have lots of love for many people. <laughs> Phil Collins is absolutely one. So many feels. So many feels. So they hit the boat, and they're going to do a sneak attack on, on Calderon. They take his boat. The boat comes pulling up where Calderon's going to meet, and they're going to do the exchange. And that's when Tubbs and Crockett jump out. They take a couple people hostage, and there's like this you know Mexican standoff between Tubbs. Now, Crockett... He's got, got like one guy by the neck and he's holding like a freaking submachine gun <laughs> with one hand, right? And then Tubbs has got, you know, he's he's just got his hand. Uh, he might have a handgun or he, he, he might have like an Uzi style gun or something like that. I can't I can't remember exactly. He's got like a handgun, right? I think so. I thought he had that shotgun. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's like, uh, so there's a stare down and then shooting breaks out. And of course, the Cro Cro Crockett and Tubbs body shields take all the bullets. And Crockett is just shooting this like M16 from the hip and just getting off like sweet money shots. Just ba bam, ba bam, just dropping people. Yeah, Meanwhile, so. Calderon's guys are like worse shots than stormtroopers. Uh, uh, they're shooting in the air, they're shooting the <laughs> boat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of them still got the ski on. <laughs> um. <laughs> so they uh they shoot everyone down they start hunting for calderon and tubs gets calderon which cornered. crockett's mm -hmm. crockett's totally had lashbacks to nom <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's like jumping in the water and rolling around <laughs> uh. <laughs> so tubs corners calderon and he's got gun to his head and Croc is telling him, this, this is the way you want to do it. And you see the anger in Tubbs' face that he wants to take care of Calderon and get vengeance for his brother. And so they, Sonny successfully talks Tubbs out of killing Calderon and they arrest him. They got their man. Mm -hmm. Except Tubbs, don't when, do it, man. They won't let you ride on the boat no more. <laughs> <laughs> Except for they won't they let us hang him. out no more. Okay, so let's close this out. We make it to the last scene. There's a little celebration between Tubbs and Crockett. They finally got their man. They're going to go pick him up, and they're extraditing him to Orlando. I don't, they they describe it in the episode, but I can't remember why. They're kind of confused about it too, right? That they don't know why they're they're, well, they're doing it. No, no, Cr uh, Crockett is all all for it. This is Crockett's brilliant plan. They're going to move him to the sub to the suburbs in Orlando. <laughs> In a van with blacked out windows, so he doesn't even know. Calderon doesn't even know where he is mm. to hide him from Calderon's people until he goes to court. Oh. You know, this way they break him out or anything. So, and then this is when we learn that he had uh, that he was uh, a judge showed up and re and released Calderon on two million dollars bail because. But no one ever skips out on $2 million bail because apparently uh, there's no way a Coke dealer can come up with $200,000 bond. Yeah, yeah. And have nowhere else to run to, you know, someone who's from another country. Yes, yes. Which plays into now we see Tubbs and Crockett who don't tell anyone on the, on the police force or call for any backup. Instead, they drive directly to somehow no... Uh, where Calderon is taking off just in time to watch Calderon's plane fly away. Yep. Yep. And Cal so Calderon escapes. This whole episode has been for nothing. Yes. Which <laughs> not I think gonna lie, you look if, at. If I was Tubbs, it, it, I would have turned it, and just bitch slapped Crockett right there. <laughs> <laughs> like, so hard. Dumbass Miami I police force. Chance. Let my man to go. Right. I, he was in the crosshairs and I was ready to get my vengeance. And now he's on his <laughs> yeah, way I had, to fucking Cuba. Uh, I had to kill someone in an alley. I'm probably going to lose my badge. And the one person I came down here to catch, you just let fly away. Yeah. So, and that, so, so by that, the way, in the eighties, in the eighties, totally okay for them to, for a bad guy just to get on a plane and fly away. Yeah. Nowadays, like, yeah. Our post 9 11 world. Would have yeah, they just, they would have bombed that bitch out of the sky real fast. <laughs> right? Are you serious? Because they, yes. they would have 
they would have had fighter jets surrounding that thing, getting it into the water in like the thirty seconds. Maybe yeah. they would watch it take yeah. off and then uh, very quickly fall back into the ocean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I live in Washington when, when President Obama was here. There was a guy who was flying a Cessna plane who forgot to file a flight plan. They scrambled F-16 jets within two minutes. They were yeah. on his ass coming from Portland. Yeah, I remember, I remember that. S- yeah, because yeah, they, I- they scrambled out of Portland and they were going so fast that they caused a sonic boom as they were flying over yes. the metro because I was living in Olympia then. And so, like, I'm just sitting in there. All of a sudden, boom, it, like, shakes the whole fucking building because the sonic boom and these jets just hauling ass from Portland. Yeah, I was working with my friend Justin in – um we were in Tukwila when it happened. And when the sonic boom happened, we thought that a transformer exploded or something. It was so loud. Mm-hmm. Everyone came out of their apartments. Everyone stopped what they were doing for about 20 minutes. Everyone was trying to was on their phone or was calling people trying to figure out what the hell just happened. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine how much you would like just totally shit yourself if you <laughs> if you were just a dude with a plane and yeah. forgot to I guess inform the necessary people, though it seems very strange that someone who flies planes would forget to file a flight plan. But yeah, well, no, I think he, I think technically he filed a flight plan, but because the president was traveling in, no one was supposed to be flying at that time. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and so he was in the air when no one should have been in the air and they just instantly just bam, scrambled jets on him and force him to land within five minutes. Yeah. Right. Like it was that crazy. Meanwhile, Calderon is on his way back to happy Cuba. Yep. Yep. No harm, no foul. Yes. We're good. Right. And so he's just like, Oh, don't worry about it. He'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> we'll catch him. We'll catch him next time. Ah, shoot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that pretty much sums it up for the episode. You know, we have our closing scene where, where Crockett, Tells Tubbs like, "Hey man, you know, I kind of like you. You like me? You should stay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like me? Yes or no?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so just so I'm clear, they they work it out at that end conversation that Tubbs is going to stay, and they're still going to let everyone think that he's Raphael Tubbs, right? They're not. They're still not going to tell anyone that that he's a, that that he's an imposter. Uh, I mean, I don't think yeah, that they explicitly see- state state that though he's just like hey what would you think about staying in miami and and tubbs is like oh maybe maybe and then it, it and i'm ends. incredibly like, they don't explicitly state it mm-hmm. i'm i'm incredibly confused they just like that common hiring practice in miami like hey you want to join the miami police force yeah like yeah. just hang out here like <laughs> no transfer needed just stay <laughs> hey, yeah. we just totally failed on this huge mission that we were on. You want to stay? Yeah, and uh, a whole bunch of people yeah. died while we were doing this, and we still didn't catch the bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it's like, like at the end of the episode, it's like, hey, you want to stay on my boat with me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that's about sums up the episode. Does uh, John, you got any closing thoughts? My closing thoughts are: I want to see how long it takes before female Tubbs actually has a speaking part in this, and it's actually relevant to the show. Because I think once she starts talking, she's going to be a cool, like Foxy Brown type character. <laughs> but I'm waiting to see how long it takes for us to meet that character. Because right now, mm-hmm. she is still just background noise. Hmm. Hmm. Jenna, any closing thoughts? You know, I'm just still trying to figure out how they're wearing closed-toed shoes when they're on the beach so often. (laughs) (laughs) I I mean, like, granted, no socks because it's too hot for socks, but then that's got to get sweaty and the 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 sand in there—it's got to be a mess. (laughs) They must have sand everywhere. Everywhere. You know, my closing thoughts are: you know, this show for me is really hot and cold. I spend most of my time like really not caring what's happening in between, 
but then there will be a scene that just like sucks me in to hold to hold me through those slow parts until the next thing comes up when they go to the club and Tubbs meets Calderon at the club like that just sucked me in and I couldn't take my eyes away and then there's some other stuff that happens and I'm like kind of taking notes and I'm I'm checking my phone and stuff and then we get to Phil Collins in the air tonight just sucks me right in so you know the show does a great job of being able to hook you and key parts to keep you to, to keep your attention while still being able able to expand the storyline to be in a 50 minute episode you know what i find interesting yes. just to comment on that is that those major notable moments are very music forward like yes. that was the lionel richie scene and then the phil collins scene and mm-hmm. i find myself often yeah and I, I think i've even like in my own notes i i've made note of this but the music alone is reason to keep watching the show mm-hmm. and, yeah, this and is... they choose the spots for that music very mm-hmm. well and that's mm-hmm. something that I think they, they the spots where they choose to do the music and how it relates to the scene is incredible how they pick those spots. And, you know, it's like the perfect spots. As soon as you start to lose interest, yep. bam, they hit you with one of those scenes. Exactly. And we were I was talking to Melissa about this yesterday where because they were gonna watch pretty and pink and i was talking about that you know music in movies were different in the 80s because there would be a popular song you know a number one billboard song would be in a you know number one grossing movie and forever you pair those two together right you pair this song with this scene and that's why 80s people hold on to it for so long because it has such a bigger pop culture moment than what those things are like now this is miami vice is one of those things forever in the air tonight is inextricably linked with Tubbs and Crockett in that driving scene when, when, when they're going to bust Calderon. Forever, that those two will be linked. You cannot pull those apart. So that's going to sum it up for this week. This has been a long episode going over this second part of the pilot. Next week, we'll tackle our first official episode where it's no longer Tubbs and Crockett just trying to figure each other out and nail down the, the biggest crook, but into regular police duty. And uh, I'm looking forward to digging into that episode. That's and do it's it. about porn. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so we're so we're day is moist. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast has been sponsored by the word moist. <laughs> moist. <laughs> <laughs> so that's gonna sum it up for this week. Uh be sure to check out our episode next week and uh we'll see you later. Bye everyone. Bye. <laughs> Stay dry, everybody. Mm-hmm.